Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. Over 65 years on the throne, yet hers is a reign that nearly didn't happen. I think as for Princess Elizabeth, the abdication must have been catastrophic. Driven by duty. My whole life shall be devoted to your service. She's ruled over crisis and war. Our thoughts today are with those in the South Atlantic. And dramatic social and technological change. Television has made it possible for many of you to see me in your homes on Christmas Day. She's seen over 12 prime ministers come and go. The Queen has a very sharp mind. She's endured the breakup of the empire and the creation of her beloved Commonwealth. The Queen had an instinct of what the new Commonwealth was about. Throughout it all, she's been a steadying presence. Yet the most famous woman in the world remains mysterious. This is the inside story as told by her closest friends and advisors. I think the Queen is basically a very shy person. She's very humble, actually. She's a wonderful mimic. I mean, she's really, really funny. It's hard to imagine a world without her. She has done her job bloody well. Elizabeth, the wife, the mother, the queen. The 90s had been a very difficult decade for the Queen. She dealt with a very public backlash after the breakup of her children's marriages. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. And following the death of Diana, public opinion was at an all-time low. The Queen was seen as out of touch, traditional and too formal. As the 21st century beckoned, the monarchy needed once again to rethink the way it related to its people. Tony Blair had swept to power in 1997. We ran for office as New Labour, we will govern as New Labour. He was the Queen's 10th Prime Minister, her youngest to date, and perhaps her most modern. And he was all too aware of the importance of her role as our monarch. The Queen regards the monarchy as a huge responsibility, and all of her life has been trying to live out this sense of duty and obligation, and to make sure that the monarchy remains still relevant to people, I found her ultimately very knowledgeable about issues and with this ability to kind of sense where public opinion was in, in a way that you know, would have put to shame many politicians. Alistair Campbell was Tony Blair's director of communications at the end of the 90s and has written about the Queen. One of the people I interviewed, one of her circle, talked about how important it is to her that she is held in affection. He said, the opposite of affection is disaffection. And if you have a public disaffected with the monarchy, you have no monarchy. The new century was a chance for the Queen to rebuild bridges and reconnect with her public. And Tony Blair wanted to help the monarchy do just that. To celebrate the arrival of this century, New Labour built the Millennium Dome and planned a huge New Year's Eve celebration to be televised to millions of viewers. Tony Blair wanted the Queen to be guest of honour and join her people at this significant time. It was obviously a, a very big moment in history. Yeah, it was important that she was out there on that evening, I think. The idea was that the Queen and the nation would be entertained by breathtaking acts from all over Britain. There's this wonderful performance that was going on 60 feet above our heads. I had this terrible vision of these people somehow falling from the, the top of the dome and crushing the royal family and thinking that this would not be, this is not a great headline for the world. The Millennium celebrations included a spectacular fireworks display. But inside the dome, Blair's plan was turning into a night the Queen would rather forget. News editor Stuart Purvis was a guest at the dome. You have to remember that the Millennium Night celebration at uh, Greenwich was not a royal production. It was almost a political production, really. Uh, and it showed. Uh, it was really, really a bad event. I suspect the Queen thought, this isn't one of my shows, if you like. And she was really not comfortable with the whole thing. As Big Ben struck midnight, the whole dome broke into Old Lang Syne. This was all a bit weird. Suddenly, it was a kind of family occasion. Uh, and what do you do? Well, of course, probably Tony Blair and uh, Cherie, uh, like in our household, they do, they shake out, they do all this. Well, um, Scottish household, 
Scotland's grand Scottish household. They don't do that because the ladies don't want to get all their diamonds and things cluttered up with that. So you hold hands like this. So the Queen and Prince Philip were doing it their way. Tony and Shri were probably thinking, well, how do we do it? And so everyone is feeling a little bit awkward. Her discomfort was palpable to the millions who watched the celebrations on TV. I think Tony was just a little bit conscious of the fact that he's bringing the new millennium with the Queen, and, and that's never been done before. Said, so, do you grab her hands and make them cross over? And said, so, no, I don't think it, I don't think it'd been rehearsed. <laughs> well, the whole razzmatazz of the thing, I don't know. It's sort of it wasn't as you normally see her. To me, it seemed to be, you know, watching. I thought, what, we're putting in a rather funny situation. But she has to react, she has to cope with it. Seen kissing the Queen. It was just caught, I think, just for a minute, just giving her a kiss, which one felt at the time, here, you know, I'm here, it's been, it's all right. Here. He was reassuring her that he could get through that situation. I thought the Queen was a bit uncomfortable, and I felt really sorry for her, but... I mean, frankly, I was a bit uncomfortable. The whole event was very odd, and the whole night passed in a bit of a blur, frankly. But anyway, she put up with it in extremely, you know, good spirits, considering. The event had put the Queen in an undignified position. Her attempts to reconnect and seem less traditional hadn't had the best of starts. At the turn of the century, the Queen was battling negative public feeling. The events at the Millennium Dome had done little to restore her popularity. And it wasn't just a problem at home. Abroad, her unpopularity had been building for some time. In Australia, there were plans to remove her as queen. Critics speculated that if it could happen down under, then one day it could happen in the UK. In the 1990s, Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating had proposed a republic. It would be the intention that as a result, of this committee's deliberations and the public discussion that would follow, the Australian people would be in a position to decide by referendum later in the decade whether Australia should become a republic by the year 2001. Though there's a lot of affection for the Queen in this country still, the country's outlook and aspirations can be represented by a non-Australian. When I met the Queen in Balmoral, she said, of course, I will always take the advice of Australian ministers and the Australian people. And I said, ma'am, we'd expect no less and ask for no more. As well as Australia, the Queen was the head of 16 different nations across the globe, from Canada to Jamaica, New Zealand to Papua New Guinea. If Australia became a republic, more countries could follow suit. But despite the high stakes, she was careful not to get involved in the public debate. There was an affection there. After all, Prince Charles had been to Geelong um, Grammar School for, for, for a term or so. I think it would be disappointing um, to the Queen. But on the other hand, she uh, had really accepted that it was the decision for the Australian people to make. In 1996, Keating was replaced as Prime Minister by John Howard, a politician with monarchist sympathies. But the referendum would still go ahead as planned. I honestly do not believe Australia would be a better... And unless there's a good reason, you don't break links with your history. But even more important than that, it works. On the 6th of November 1999, Australia went to the polls. As the Queen nervously waited for the result, it looked like her 48-year rule of Australia was about to end. Well, the Queen was intensely interested in the outcome. Uh, I knew that whatever the outcome would be, she would uh, wish Australia well and retain an interest and affection in it. When the ballots were counted, the results were a surprise to many. All six states had voted to keep the Queen. The country had an appointment with history and it failed the appointment. Incidentally, the Australian rugby team were in the UK, competing in the World Rugby Cup final in Cardiff. The Queen was there to present the trophy to the winner. I'm told she was very pleased but, uh, by the person who officially conveyed the result. What we didn't know is that the Australians would come to the UK and win the Rugby World Cup, which added a certain piquancy to it, including the Queen presenting the trophy to Johnny Oz, the Australian captain, just after the result of the referendum. As they say in Fleet Street, you couldn't have made 
entrada. The Queen's presence at the Rugby World Cup final was a symbolic moment. For many Australians, it was cause for a double celebration. The Queen had held her own in the country she regarded with fondness. But closer to home, family worries were about to test her in a far more personal way. The Queen's sister, Princess Margaret, had been ill for some time. In 2002, her health took a turn for the worse. Princess Margaret had always been the Queen's glamorous and mischievous sister, and they were devoted to each other. She was the companion of her childhood, and she was younger than the Queen, and they did talk a lot, more or less every day, so she was a very, very constant presence in her life. Growing up, the Queen's family had been a tight-knit unit. They called themselves Us Four. After the death of their father, two sisters became even closer, and they'd had other difficult times. In the 50s, the Queen had not been able to support her sister's relationship with divorcee group captain Peter Townsend. But despite this tension, they had remained close. Lady Glen Connor was one of Princess Margaret's best friends and a maid of honor at the coronation. Princess Margaret adored the Queen and, and was always very loyal. I mean, she always talked um, and was very proud of what the Queen had done and all that. During the breakup of Princess Margaret's marriage to Anthony Arms, with her a lot, and she sort of did her best to make it uh, better for Princess Margaret. I think. In February 2002, Princess Margaret died from her third and final stroke. The Queen had lost her only sister. Well, I would imagine she was expecting it because she had Prince Margaret been ill for a very long time. We're all devoted to her. She was so good to everybody and. I think a lot of people wept a lot. In a way, it was sad, but I was so glad that Princess Margaret, who'd suffered so much at the end, and for somebody like that, who'd been so vivacious and beautiful um, and enjoying life, to see her in a wheelchair, unable to see, I, you know, it broke my heart, actually. Princess Margaret's funeral was a relatively low-key affair for a member of the royal family. For the Queen, it was a doubly sad occasion. Princess Margaret's funeral fell on a very painful anniversary. Fifty years ago to the day, they had buried her father in the same chapel at Windsor. When Princess Margaret died and the Queen Mother was still at Sandringham where she would have probably stayed, but she insisted on coming down to Windsor and taking part in the funeral. A fragile Queen Mother didn't want to be seen by the press. We all sat in front, all the ladies in waiting, together. And it was terribly poignant because the Queen Mother was a wheelchair. And when the coffin went by, she tried to stand up. Well, I think she may have been helped up so that she could be standing when Princess Margaret's coffin went. Princess Margaret was cremated, one of the first members of our family, I think, because she wanted to be buried between her parents. And there was any room, really, for ashes. In the weeks after Princess Margaret's death, the Queen Mother's health continued to deteriorate. The Queen obviously had been worried about the Queen Mother for some time because the Queen Mother was an, an enormous age and, and was appearing in public very regularly. The Queen would obviously be worried that she was going to fall over or something, which luckily she never did. I think the Queen Mother had been ill for some time and she had some trouble with her lungs, I think. Constant coughing and that sort of thing. But it was all kept fairly low-key, you know, they didn't talk about it much. And she was, after all, in her 102nd year, I think. Wonderful. The Queen Mother had been the Queen's rock throughout her 50-year reign. I think hardly a day went by without communication between them, either visit or telephone call. And when the Queen was overseas, overseas she wrote a series of letters every day back to her mother. I mean, the Queen Mother had a lot of adulation from the public and people got a lot of her mother's qualities in her, the Queen. Just six weeks after Princess Margaret's death, on the 30th of March, the 101-year-old Queen Mother passed away. The Queen Mother mysteriously and miraculously waited until the one day in the year when she could have died without any inconvenience to anybody. She waited until 
queen was but Windsor, with all her family around her. The queen was out riding and was just summoned to Royal Lodge, and as understand it, the queen mother had her head perfectly all right until about 10 minutes before she died, when she just sort of basically spun away. The two women who had been closest to the queen throughout her 50-year reign were now gone. She'd lost her mother, who was not only a friend and companion, but her mother, somebody she spoke to every day on the telephone that she would visit regularly, that she knew and loved, and was the link also with her father, you know, a key figure in the Queen's life. The Queen Mother's would be the first royal public funeral at Westminster Abbey since Princess Diana's in 1997. There was speculation in the newspapers that people wouldn't turn up, that, you know, the Queen Mother, being over 100 years old, belonged to a, another generation, that people wouldn't remember her. In fact, people turned up in their hundreds of thousands. I mean, the country was mourning. Sir Michael Wilcox was the Queen's black rod at the time. He was her daily representative in Parliament and responsible for many ceremonial duties. After the Queen Mother's death, he organised for the coffin to be brought to Westminster Hall, where the public would come to pay their respects. Initially, when she died, and at the first meeting, coordinating meeting at Buckingham Palace, there was a sense that we should only open the lying in state for a limited period during the day. And I argued against that. I felt that the nation would turn out for the Queen, both in sympathy and to show their affection. We opened uh, on the first morning, and within three hours, we had a three-mile queue. And I then said, OK, we'll keep it open 24 hours a day. It was overwhelming, and the queue went right way out down the other side of the Thames. There were all kinds of people. There were young children, um, young mothers, young families, and the older generation. So it, it, you, you name it, and they were in that queue. Over a million people came to mourn the Queen Mother. It is the fairy tale Queen Mother, the mother of our sovereign. For much older people, she was the Queen during the Second World War. She represented their lifetime story. There is an outpouring of emotion that is about oneself, one's country, exemplified in the life of the person who has died. One hesitates to compare it to the emotion over Diana, but it, it, it was a article after the death of Diana swung decisively in the monarchy's favour. She's had a great life, and Diana only had a short life, but um, she's done so much for history, she's gone through so much, and she just really puts the backbone back into Britain. She was a wonderful lady. We love him very much, and he do a lot of good for we. As the Queen left Westminster Hall, the crowd reacted in a surprising way. It would be a transformative moment as the public now began support the Queen. There was this very polite, very discreet clapping, which was almost symbolising the transference of affection from one great matriarch to another. And I know that the Queen was very touched by that. On the eve of the funeral, the Queen addressed the nation. Ever since my beloved mother died over a week ago, I have been deeply moved by the outpouring of affection which has accompanied her death. But the extent of the tribute that huge numbers of you have paid my mother in the last few days has been overwhelming. I thank you for the support you are giving me and my family as we come to terms with her death and the void she has left in our midst. We must have changed her life enormously to lose her mother and her sister within a few months of each other like that. It must have been very traumatic for her, very sad. I think she missed them a lot. I mean, suddenly she lost her two after the service at Westminster Abbey, the Queen Mother's coffin was taken to Windsor Castle, its final resting place, alongside her husband and daughter, Princess Margaret. I think with the death of the Queen Mother, there was a subtle change in the role of the Queen. Now, the Queen was the, uh, the oldest member of the family. She was the matriarch. She, as it were, was moving into the Queen Victoria role. She was senior member of world royalty. And some people say that that almost freed her, that she seemed to relax a bit. Well, Martin Chartres, who I think was her best private secretary, always used to say, wait and see what happens when the Queen Mother dies. Because I think with any parent, somehow they're always looking over your shoulder. And suddenly, she did blossom. There's no question about it. These deaths would herald a new era in the Queen's reign. At the turn of the century, the Queen had lost two 
the most important people in her life, her sister Princess Margaret and the Queen Mother. Despite the public sympathy for the Queen, the Sovereign still had a problem with her image. She needed a new way to connect to her people and show that she was in touch. She and her senior advisors had created a working party to develop a new strategy. They called it the Way Ahead Group. She, not just the Queen, every single member of the inner royal family came to the Way Ahead Group and the private secretaries. The meetings were sometimes a bit chaotic. I, I recall that the Queen had a bit of a tendency to, to chat to whoever was sitting next to her rather than um, <laughs> paying full attention to the proceedings. The Duke of Edinburgh had to, had to sort of call people to order from time to time. One of the issues the group looked at was the itinerary for the Queen's public engagements. The Way Ahead group suggested that she made her visits edgier and more inclusive. We needed to look at the way the royal program was made up and modernize it a bit and make sure that the monarchy reflected um, society uh, more accurately. I mean, there were lots of visits around the home counties because of um, the proximity of Windsor and Buckingham Palace. Should there be a greater geographical spread, making sure that, you know, different parts of the country saw all this happening. When she visited industry, she tended to go to factories when actually the way the economy had moved was that there were far more service companies for instance, in the entertainment sector, it's easier to get a little bit stuck in your ways. Um, this was a deliberate attempt to just nudge things forward a bit. The Queen is very pragmatic. She's willing to look at the pros and cons of, a, of an argument and then go for something that's, you know, the, the modern way of doing things. That's another feature of her character. 2002 would be the Queen's Golden Jubilee year, marking 50 years on the throne. But had the Queen done enough? to reach out to her people. Had the Way Ahead group's planning been successful? I remember the Silver Jubilee of 1977 and what a huge event it was, how exciting it was, the street parties. And then as we came up to the Golden Jubilee, 25 years later, 50 years of Elizabeth II on the throne, I sensed, oh goodness, it's not going to be as big an event. Somehow this last decade has been too troubled for the royal family. It's going to be a bit muted. And I think there was apprehension in Buckingham Palace as well. Critics questioned whether the general public would organize any events at all to celebrate 50 years on the throne. In 2001, the palace website included a snooker tournament and a tree planting as some of the few events being planned. The Guardian ran with the headline, Palace Plays Down Fear of Jubilee Flop. The palace asked Lord Stirling, who had organized the Silver Jubilee, whether he could once again put together a program of celebrations. But even he had his reservations. I said that I need about 48 hours to find out as to whether or not there will be the appetite. Because so much had happened as to whether people even wanted to celebrate. Lord Sterling called his friends in big business. Get support of about close to three million pounds. He now needed to get the public on side. I remember asking uh, Murdoch and Craig they would feel about supporting it and uh, Rupert in particular is hugely supportive of the Queen etc. Rupert Murdoch's newspapers began to get behind the Golden Jubilee. The Sun tried to encourage its readers with the headline have a bash for her marriage. It would not have been sensible to have spent a lot of time saying this is going to be the greatest event in British history. I think one of the great insights was don't set expectations too and that would have come from the Queen herself, who doesn't like a fuss. The Queen's Golden Jubilee celebrations kicked off with a nationwide tour. But would the public turn out to greet her? Some were fearful that the Queen might turn up and there wouldn't be a particularly warm welcome. Or would there be a welcome at all beyond the, the Mayor turning up and the civic dignitaries? In fact, it was a huge success. <laughs> I was privileged to be part of the tour, to go on some of these visits. And the Queen was moved, was touched, to find that so many people turned up, cheering, waving their flags. And from people being apprehensive about it, it turned into a huge triumph.
and she said, what's this? And I said um, that it was a picture and I drew it for her and she said thank you. I thought she was going to be quite nice as she was. The Golden Jubilee was a great opportunity to put further into practice some of the initiatives that had been trialled in the previous year. So I think that was a really good year. And people were genuinely surprised that the Queen was out and about in the way that she was, visiting inner cities, disadvantaged people, showing Britain for better and also the areas that needed to have light shone on it. In her Golden Jubilee year, the Queen also visited the industrial town of Scunthorpe and her first British mosque. To engage with the Muslim community in this way was one of the most mould-breaking decisions she'd ever made and one of the most inclusive. The idea came after 9-11, when the terrorist attack on Twin Towers, and um, I said to them that I need to send the letter to Her Majesty the Queen to invite her. We got the top class mask in, in London and all this area, and she decided to not go there, but decided to come in small, tiny town, North Lincolnshire, uh, which was great. 9-11 just happened. There was a lot of um, ex from Her Majesty the Queen to come to the mos mosque at that time to show that it uh, doesn't matter what happened, nobody can divide us and uh, we are one nation and one people. And we, I, I personally really appreciate that. She took the shoes off and she came into the, the mosque. We were all lined up, everybody to meet her. We were all anxious and not really prepared, but when we met Her Majesty, uh, it was like meeting someone that we knew from our childhood. She was such a nice, down-to-earth person. Queen takes a huge interest in people when she meets them. I mean, she doesn't just shake hands and turn away. She really wants to talk to them and to know what they're doing and what their interests are. She was very interesting in the history of Islam, uh, especially the Mecca, because we had all the pictures here, you see, and she was, she was asking about that. And I was lucky enough to give her a Quran uh, myself, uh, which she accepted, and I think it's still somewhere kept in a safe place, maybe in Buckingham Palace, I don't know. And she might read it. She is queen for all of us, and it is fantastic that we made the history, the rest of our life and other people's life, it will stay with us. You know, what she did was really, she won heart of millions of Muslims. <laughs> At the start of the century, the Queen had been unpopular and out of touch. In her Golden Jubilee year, she showed that she was prepared to evolve as she met different kinds of people and went to new places. Change has become a constant. Managing it has become an expanding discipline. The way we embrace it defines our future. Her Jubilee parade in June 2002 was the ultimate example of this relaunch. This was a new, more inclusive kind of monarchy. 20,000 people marched down the Mall, including firemen, circus performers, Bollywood dancers, and even Hell's Angels. How far have you come to be here today? Uh, how far is Australia? 10,000 miles? <laughs> Oh, well, I'm a true royalist. I just think it's wonderful. The whole world seemed to have come out to celebrate with her. As the highlight of the celebrations, the Jubilee organizers planned two huge concerts at Buckingham Palace, one classical, one pop. Three years earlier, the Queen had been the guest of honor for the New Year's Eve celebrations at the Millennium Dome, which had left her feeling uncomfortable. The Jubilee concerts were her opportunity to show the world that she could be less traditional, less stiff, an event to take place in its grounds. I had the pleasure of an audience with the Queen to bring her up to date as what was transpiring, and it was in her private office with one, one of the great bay windows at the back of the palace. And then I mentioned about the various events, and in particular, the concerts were going to take place in the palace. And she said, oh, yes, you, is, and you must come and come. And so we, we went and she took me over to the window. And, and of course, outside, they've got all the bulldozers and scaffolding and goodness knows what else. And she said, look what they're doing to my garden. <laughs> it wasn't just the great and the good that were invited. The general public would get a chance to attend the party at the palace. Two million people entered the ballot for golden tickets. Having these major events in the palace itself, I think, was a brilliant idea it sort of 
brought people into it as against having the mystique. The pop party at the palace lasted for three hours. The concert's iconic moment would be Brian May from Queen on the top of Buckingham Palace. The Queen had heard her national anthem many times, but not quite like this. I think, you know, British people are always up for a party. And I think perhaps most importantly, that actually, given the opportunity to say thank you to their sovereign, the British people will take that opportunity and they will say thank you. And that's what I think can be symbolised in those events. The Queen didn't expect much of the Golden Jubilee, but perhaps with the Golden Jubilee, we see the beginning of a more self-confident monarch emerging. It's her millennium. It's her turning of the clock and moving into a new, uh, very relaxed, very happy age. The Golden Jubilee had put the Queen back on top, but there was still a problem that she needed to resolve. At the classical concert, a few rows back from Prince Charles was his longtime mistress, Camilla Parker Bowles. This was her first public appearance in the presence of the Queen. For the Queen, to truly put the difficulties of the past decade behind her, Camilla's status in the royal family needed to be dealt with once and for all. By 2005, it became clear that Prince Charles's relationship with divorcee Camilla Parker Bowles needed to be sorted out. Camilla's presence tarnished the Queen's public image. Divorce from the early years has been a bugbear of, of, of the Queen's reign from the abdication through Margaret um, and then up to um, Charles and Diana. It manifested itself still as an issue when it came to the rematch of these two divorced persons, Charles and, and, and Camilla. But there was this extra time for the breakup of the marriage and the tragedy of, of, of Diana. By the time of the Jubilee, Camilla was living with the prince at Highgrove. He had always made it absolutely clear that she was a non-negotiable part of his life. So you have a situation where the Prince of Wales is basically, if I can put it like this, living with his mistress. And that's not very satisfactory because one day he becomes head of the Church of England. She was a divorcee. He had also been divorced, but his first wife was dead. In an attempt to introduce a more positive image of Camilla, Prince Charles ran a carefully planned public relations campaign. The Camilla problem needed to be settled before his succession to the throne. If he was going to marry her, it had to happen during the Queen's reign. And so uh, a very well orchestrated campaign set up, which took about two or three years, uh, at the end of which they were able to marry. The 9th of April, 2005, Charles and Camilla married in Windsor Registry Office. But there was one key person who could not attend. The Queen clearly believes in being the defender of the faith, and people also forget she is the supreme governor of the Church of England. So there are certain things that she will not do because of the kind of authority God has given her. The Queen could not possibly be seen to countenance the remarriage of two divorced persons. So it was quite simple. They had to go down to a registry office in town, in Windsor, and get that side of things done, the public side, um, with her not involved. But it doesn't mean she will be unloving. So she would really recuse herself from those areas, which in fact she says to herself, I am the Supreme Governor, but charge my son, a service where God's blessing and forgiveness is being asked for, I'll be there. The Queen did attend the blessing and hosted their reception at Windsor Castle. Sir Nicholas Soames was one of the wedding guests. It was a wonderful day, a huge gathering in St George's Hall. And the Queen was very, very much on parade. And she made the most charming speech. It was a special day for the Queen in more than one ways, in that it was the day of the Grand National. Last tapped. The voice says, the Queen has an announcement to make, an important announcement. And the Queen stands there and says, yes, exciting news, everyone. Hedge Hunter has won the Grand National. She used it as a, a metaphor and talked about Charles and Camilla and said how they'd survived Beecher's Brook, how they'd survived the chair uh, and all the other obstacles. She said, welcome 
to the winner's enclosure. And to liken the struggle they'd been through to uh, the Grand National from the Queen really was the sign of approval. She was absolutely charming, and there was a great roar of approval. I mean, a great roar after she'd done it. It was, it was, a, it was a great day. No, I absolutely, I, I you know, I, gosh, I mean, what a time it has been. The marriage seemed to draw a line under the Queen's troubles. In 2006, as she approached 80, the monarch moved into a new phase. I do think the press in particular didn't see the royal family institution, the monarchy, as being a source of stories in the way that they had previously, and that made a difference. I think the country were getting used to a new generation of the royal family, and I think the fact the young princes were emerging made a huge difference. I think people began to see the queen also, not just as a mother, but as a grandmother. As the decade ended, her grandchildren began to take a more visible role in royal life. They obviously love her and I'm sure she loves them too. And I'm sure they go to her for advice because they couldn't have a better person to ask. I think if you ask Prince William and Prince Harry if they'd learned anything from the Queen of the Duke of Edinburgh, they would say a great deal. I know that's the case because I've heard them talk about their grandparents uh, in terms of respect, affection, but also seeing how they do things. And if you like the style of Prince William and Prince Harry, it's because they've learned a lot from past masters at the game. As the Queen headed towards the end of the decade, she had a new confidence. I think the Queen is basically a very shy person. I've seen her stepping out of the royal train and having to gear herself up to face the crowds many times. When that challenge is overlaid with public criticism, as there was, for instance, at the time of Princess Diana's death, it's very hard to bear. So if instead, what you're reading in the newspapers and seeing on television is broadly supportive and warm towards you. You relax in turn, and that, that is what's happened um, to some degree for the Queen. Finally, she came into her own and became in many ways a different woman, clearly at ease with herself, but she is clearly totally at ease enjoying her job, and the country is enjoying her doing it and wants her to go on doing it as long as jolly well possible. She had seen personal loss with the deaths of her mother and sister. She had seen her son and heir, Prince Charles, remarry, and she had proved her relevance to the British people. At the end of the decade, her popularity had never been so high. The world now saw a more self-assured monarch. The nation's grand... Recognised that you have to be more out there with the people in today's world. But you never forget with her that she's the queen. And that ability to retain the aura at the same time as move with the new age, that's really what marks her out, I think. In 2012, the queen celebrated her diamond jubilee, marking 60 years on the throne. She became only the second monarch in British history to reach this landmark. The first had been her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. Queen Elizabeth II's reign had encountered many highs and lows in its six decades, but she had come through them all. Inevitably, a long life can pass by many milestones. My own is no exception. As the Queen moved into her 90s, the decade would test her strength, wisdom and moral leadership. But in 2012, the UK prepared to celebrate the Queen's Jubilee thank her for her years of service. By the time of the Diamond Jubilee, the Queen had had a bit of practice at Jubilees. They didn't worry her so much anymore. She had entered this um, more serene, uh, less controversial aspect of her reign. For the Queen, it was a moment of saying, I have come through it all. I have come difficult times, the very hard times, the 70s, the 90s, and now here I am still soaring in high in popularity. To mark her Diamond Jubilee, Britain would hold year-long celebrations. The highlight was a River Thames pageant, harking back to the golden era of Elizabeth I. I wanted to do something wonderful on the Thames and uh, proposed the idea uh, for a pageant, um, and a pageant of the size and scale which hadn't been seen on the river 
um, for over 200, 300 years. The vision was to bring the Thames to life, you know, magnificently with boats and music and bells and whistles. The Queen would survey a flotilla of passing boats. Over a million people lined the river to catch a glimpse of the Queen and her Thames pageant. Every single one of them wanted to express their pride in their nation and their patriotism to the Queen. I think that's what motivated um, everyone. A wonderful day. Everywhere you looked, you looked up to the high rises, on the bridge parapets, on the riverside. Everywhere there were people shouting and cheering and waving flags. It was just the most extraordinary sight. It was wonderful. Despite the June date, it rained for most of the pageant specially chosen to perform in front of the Queen. One of the singers was Monica McGee. We sing Land of Hope and Glory, and then we're greeted by the royal family. And it is honestly one of the wettest weather experiences I've ever encountered. But until we actually saw the Queen, it didn't quite hit us precisely how fantastic this occasion really was. And then I don't think anyone felt wet or cold. <laughs> and I think it just took on a kind of quite strange, otherworldly moment. Um, we just think this is our job to honour this woman and try and do our job really wonderfully for someone who's been with me done her job for decades. And I'll always remember the image of, of the singers with the mascara running in the rain. I never imagined it like that in the three years of planning that that's the way it would turn out. But it was wonderful in the way it was completed. It was also, I think, a feeling of poignancy on her part and on the part of uh, those who were there that this could well be the last time. That the idea that maybe one day before too long we won't be saying, God save the Queen anymore. Uh, added something to that occasion. As one of the world's longest serving sovereigns, the Queen has a unique wealth of experience to draw on. She meets more people who are experts in their field, including politicians and uh, industry experts and people from academia than probably anyone else around. Throughout her reign, she's received red boxes with ministerial papers and briefs from Downing Street every day. It's hard, hard work it is when you think about the Queen every night of her life. Most people can probably go home and do what they want to do, but the red box appears every single night. As long as she's been monarch, the Queen has held a weekly audience with her Prime Minister. From Winston Churchill to Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair. At a superficial level, she was just the Queen listening to the Prime Minister, as it were, and exchanging um, different conversations with the Prime Minister. But as the time went on in my interaction with her, I came to have a real regard for her basic judgment and perception about society, about the country, about the people of the country. All this helped to end hundreds of years of hatred against the British. The Queen is the world's most travelled monarch. She has officially visited over 120 countries. But in 2011, she went to a new place, just 100 miles across the sea, the Republic of Ireland. She was always really interested in the peace process, very committed to it. One of the few conversations where she literally picked up the phone and you, <laughs> you held the phone and they said it's the Queen on the phone was, was after the Northern Ireland peace agreement. For over a hundred years, British rule had been viciously contested in Ireland. Hundreds of people on both sides of the water had been killed in what came to be called the Troubles. The Queen herself suffered great personal loss. In 1979, the IRA had murdered close family members, Lord Mountbatten and his 15-year-old grandson. Known to her as Uncle Dicky, his death had been a huge shock. Queen, I think, was genuinely fond of Mountbatten. It was a totally gratuitous, pointless murder. 
To honor this great loss, he had been given a funeral at Westminster Abbey. But I think the depth of feeling is so terrible at that time. You know, with the IRA and, and what they'd done, and how do you forgive, you know? But you have to move forward the best you can. The Queen's visit to Ireland would be an extraordinary moment of diplomacy and would test her personal strength. The truth of it is that it had to be right from the Irish perspective. You know, there's a long history. Some of that history has been bloody and brutal. And it's a moment you've got to choose very carefully when the Queen, I mean, the symbol of, of, of Britain comes to visit the, the Republic. It was the Queen's, obviously the Queen's own idea that she should go to Ireland and probably had wanted to for some time. I remember thinking, oh, you know, just hope everything's going to be all right. The visit witnessed one of the country's largest security operations. Mary McAleese was the president of Ireland who hosted the Queen's stay. I can tell you that when we invited Her Majesty the Queen to come to Ireland, there were a lot of people who were not happy. I got the letters. We knew and that there would have been people who would not have wished her well. So yes, security was massive. On her first day, the Queen went to Dublin's Garden of Remembrance, a site that commemorates the Irish... Now, here was the Queen, paying her respects. She laid a wreath, she stepped back, and she did something that nobody really expected. It's a simple thing. She inclined her head. In that gesture, you could almost hear the softening of the arteries of resentment the softening of the anger, the winning over of people. Her speech at the state dinner in Dublin Castle stunned all of the guests. The very first words she used, to everybody's surprise, were five Irish words. President and friends. My reaction just was wow. And I was watching right around the audience where everybody else was saying, you know, wow. The saying of that in the Irish language went deep into the hearts of people because for, you know, for generations, the British, the British establishment had tried to obliterate this ancient language and had come very close to doing so. The speech continued in a very personal tone. Through the history, our islands have experienced more than their fair share of heartache turbulence and loss. These events have touched us all, many of us personally, and are a painful legacy. We knew that she was talking obviously about Lord Mountbatten. Um, we, again, we could feel this was a human being whose hurt and pain was real, happened in our time, happened as a result of our historic enmity. The entire trip took some very bold and risky decisions. On the second the Queen visited Croke Park, the spiritual home of Gaelic sports. But it was more than a sporting venue. In 1920, this was the site of the first Bloody Sunday. In 1920, in the middle of a match, British forces went through the gates in tanks. They opened fire on players and on spectators and killed a lot of people and maimed more. It became a moment of utter rage for Ireland that fueled the ongoing historic resentment. The president of the Gaelic Athletic Association, Christy Cooney, took the Queen to where the massacre happened. I'm sure her people had explained to her exactly what Croke Park meant. I'm sure she was aware of Bloody Sunday and she would have known the environment she was coming into. My memory of her walking onto the pitch and Christy Cooney saying to her, you know, this is where British troops came in and killed uh, 14 people on Bloody Sunday. And I can still remember a voice that was breaking with real heartache. And she just said, I know, I know. I, I just thought she carried it off extremely well. The Queen's empathy had helped her forge a new relationship with Ireland in a way that no other British statesman could have done. It's a sort of healing process in her presence, I think. And that is for her enormous capacity to 
bring people together probably who wouldn't normally want to get on particularly well. The visit was a huge success and brought Ireland and Britain closer together. The Queen would take the peace process a step further a year later in a previously unimaginable act. In 2012, she flew to a charity event in Belfast where she met with Deputy First Minister for Northern Ireland and former IRA commander Martin McGuinness. Simple handshake between the head of the British state and a former IRA commander. To be prepared to reach out and shake the hand of the people who, you know, has been responsible for the, the death of someone who was very close to her. She was prepared to overcome all of that legacy, all of that history, and in the interests of, of, of peace, to, to, to reach out and, and, and do it in a genuine way. The signal of that handshake uh, was worth millions of words. For both sides in the equation, there would have been considerable difficulties. You can imagine the kind of pressures on both. And yet, both of them are leaders. And that's what leaders are called to do, you know, to push out into the deep, to do the difficult thing, to do the courageous thing, to do the risky thing. I mean, what a gesture. If you can do that, I think most people could do a lot more than they do do to make things better. As head of state, the Queen has built bridges in ways that no politician could have done. Back at home, her responsibility in this role is one that she's had to carefully navigate over the years. The Queen must be above politics, but she is a crucial cog in our constitution. Not only does she officially open Parliament, she is still the only person who has the power to appoint a Prime Minister. She's a person who has to be satisfied that the Prime Minister has a sound majority and a basis for exercising power. In 2010, Labour Prime Minister Gordon Brown called a general election. The polls showed that there may not be a clear winner, which would leave the Queen in an unprecedented scenario about who to appoint as Prime Minister. I was working in number 10 at the time as the Prime Minister's official spokesman and it was pretty clear in the run-up to that election that it was either going to be a hung parliament or a coalition government so we could actually work out what would happen. As a result, the Queen's advisers came up with a set of written guidelines, for the first time defining what part she should play. The Cabinet manual does make absolutely clear that the Queen has no role other than a formal role in appointing the Prime Minister. She has no discretion in those areas. In the event, Labour lost their majority, but the Conservatives didn't have enough seats to form a government. With the outcome of the general election, we find ourselves in a position unknown to this generation of political leaders. As talks got underway for a coalition government, the Liberal Democrats, led by Nick Clegg, were courted by both the Conservatives and Labour. But these discussions would take time. The Queen remained at Windsor Castle for the five days of the coalition negotiations, so that no one could accuse her of intervening in the process. I was in the Prime Minister's study when he called Nick Clegg on the Tuesday afternoon and said, Nick, I can't wait any longer, nor can the Queen, I need your answer. And Nick Clegg then had to make the decision that he would go into coalition with the Conservative Party. I've informed the Queen's private secretary that it's my intention to tender my resignation to the Queen. I shall advise her to invite the leader of the opposition to seek to form a government. For his final trip to the palace, Gordon Brown took his wife and two small sons as Labour bowed out of power. The Queen's private secretary could now call David Cameron to the palace. He would become her 12th Prime Minister and her youngest to date. She has understood the role of the Crown in the British Constitution so that our political system can work and she makes it work by not interfering. The Queen has been driven throughout her long reign a commitment to public duties. But it's her personal passions that reveal the most about her. The Queen's long reign has presented her with many challenges. But one passion that's never waned is her love of horses. 
Queen is not only very keen on horses, but is also one of the great horse experts we've got in this country. And I'm sure for Her Majesty the Queen, who has been involved with horses for all her life, she finds them a great way to relax and to reflect. Oh, I think the Queen is happy because though she's driven by duty, sustained by faith, she has her passion in life, her dogs and her horses, and they do keep her happy. As the Duke of Edinburgh has said, if it doesn't fire to eat hay, she isn't interested. Ian Balding was one of the Queen's horse trainers for nearly 40 years. There is a, a special relationship between the Queen and her trainers. You'll ring Buckingham Palace and um, uh, I'll say, as Mr. Ian Balding speaking, could I speak to Her Majesty, please? Yes, one moment, sir. And five seconds later, you're through to the Queen, you know, which is uh, pretty remarkable. I've been with Her Majesty on race days, and if you happen to have a winner when she's there, that is the ultra moment. Bear in mind, she has bred all these horses herself, so she knows their mothers and their grandmothers and their great-grandmothers. And I remember a lovely horse we had for her, a colt called Magna Carta who won at Royal Ascot. He won the Ascot Stakes. The Queen learned to ride as a young child and has continued into her 90s. I'd read in the papers that the Queen had stopped riding and I knew that she loved riding every day and I thought, oh, how sad. And I wrote to her saying, ma'am, I'm so sorry to hear you've given up riding. Anyway, I had a letter back in the post the next day literally saying, that's absolute rubbish. I haven't stopped riding at all. The Queen's personal life is closely guarded, particularly in one of her favorite places, Scotland. She is descended from the Kings of Scotland and spends every summer at her home in Balmoral. It is a magical place because it's so timeless. And the dogs are there, the children can be there, friends are there. And um, there you are, the castle's their home. Well, Belmore is a very relaxed place, and I think the Queen feels relaxed when she's there. We were picnicking on, on the shores of Loch Mick, which is about eight miles from the castle, and a party of youngsters appeared, and they all had a sort of sideways look as they passed. And then one of the, one of the young ladies came back, uh, plainly a Londoner, and looking at the Queen, she said, They tell me you're the Queen. <laughs> And she said, well, I am. What are you doing here then? She said, I live here. <laughs> she loves being a Scottish country lady, but this is always in the context of Scotland as part of the British family. In 2014, there was a real danger that Scotland was going to leave the Queen's beloved British family when Prime Minister David Cameron agreed to call a referendum on Scottish independence. The ballot was to be held in September. She's in Balmoral in a high referendum campaign. In early 2014, the campaign to leave had been trailing in the polls. But by the time the Queen came to Balmoral for her summer break, the Scottish nationalists had narrowed the lead. In the last couple of weeks, the yes campaign and the no campaign were effectively neck and neck. There is a real sense of emergency taking hold in London and a sense, too, that the Queen actually could be the ace for the, for the UK campaign, that she's the person that's actually going to have to intervene to make absolutely certain that we're going to win the no vote. Despite all of her instincts to stay out of the race, despite, despite all of her instincts that it's not constitutionally proper, there is an immense amount of pressure being brought to bear on her. Just four days before the referendum, the Queen made an unprecedented comment. Veteran reporter Jim Lawson was, as usual, covering her Balmoral stay. We were in a normal place, corralled outside the church grounds. After about half an hour, the policeman came down and said, would you like to come up to the church? That was unheard of, you know. We actually wondered what was going on. And I thought, I wonder if she's going to approach the crowd. As she did, one of the bystanders mentioned the referendum. The Queen said, well, I hope people will think very carefully about the future. The bystander was happy to tell Jim the Queen's comment, but curiously wouldn't give him their details. If the Queen talks to someone, they're always delighted to tell you, but not this time. 
Some wondered whether the bystander had been planted in the crowd. Others thought it was just a chance comment. Either way, the newspapers needed to corroborate the story with Buckingham Palace. The palace didn't confirm it, but more importantly, they didn't deny it. We knew we were onto some story there. Now, if you translate that to your standing on the edge of the cliff and the Queen says to you, think very carefully about what you're about to do, she's not advising you to jump, is she? Newspaper editor Severin Carell felt the comment was the result of a lot of thought. One could read it either way. And as in that sense, it was very, very, very carefully written, very cleverly written. But we realised that the Queen had made a quite deliberate and quite carefully drafted interjection. She had intervened into the referendum campaign. On Thursday, the 18th of September, 2014, Scotland went to the polls. The majority of the people voting have voted no to the referendum question. I have worked so hard to save Scotland because I'm a proud Scot and I'm a proud Brit. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that's been a pretty fair kick of the ball. For now, the Queen's United Kingdom was intact. But this wouldn't be the last time that her position would be used in politicians' arguments. In 26 time, the question was to leave or remain in the European Union. On Monday, I will commence the process set out under our Referendum Act, and I will go to Parliament and propose that the British people decide our future in Europe. In the charged atmosphere of the EU debate, it was perhaps inevitable that someone would try to involve the Queen in their argument. Thomas Newton Dunn is political editor of The Sun. He was tipped off about a conversation between the Queen and European Union supporter Nick Clegg. Well, I was told a, a most fascinating story by a, a impeccable source uh, of an extraordinary row during a, a lunch she held in Windsor Castle. And so this is going back 2011, 2012 now. Uh, they ended up discussing Europe. Uh, the Queen ended up getting to quite a lively dust-up with the Deputy Prime Minister, who was a very strong uh, pro-European politician. The Queen was putting forward some very strong views uh, on the, the future shape of Europe and the direction which Europe was going in. The Sun wasn't only planning to report the alleged conversation, but to boost it by quoting prominent Brexiteers. This led to their infamous headline. Queen backs Brexit came from ringing up a couple of Tory MPs to... to find out what they thought about it, uh, and some of the very passionate Brexiteer MPs leaped on the suggestion that the Queen might be pretty Eurosceptic to say, well, in which case, that must mean she backs Brexit. A very closely written underneath was bombshell claim, because, of course, it was these MPs' claim she must back Brexit rather than ours. When Downing Street found out that The Sun was going to run with the headline, they began to investigate the source of the story. So when I first saw the Queen backs Brexit headline, I wanted to see very quickly what this based on and it seemed to be at a lunch that had been many years before how could she back up something several years before when it wasn't even a term that was invented or even something that was seen as a particular possibility nick clegg strongly denied the story i think it's appalling that people who want to drag the united kingdom out of the european union uh, now want to drag the queen into the european referendum debate and as for the the sun story it's nonsense it is not true i couldn't be clearer than that the palace thought that the headline was misleading and immediately lodged a complaint to the Independent Press Standards Organisation. At the time, the palace said they were extremely angry uh, and the Queen is never to be dragged into politics and they're now going to put a stop to it by making a formal complaint. They wanted to draw a line in the sand and, and to extricate the Queen from any more uh, political rows. Ipso upheld the complaint, saying the headline went further than the claim about what the Queen might think. The Sun was forced to print its ruling, but by then, the whole story had fueled the Brexit debate. I don't know that you could necessarily say that it persuaded people to vote for Brexit, but I think it was certainly another tick in the column of people who wanted to leave the EU. We know from little opinions, but in public, in terms of aura, she exudes impartiality. She exudes being what a constitutional monarch should be, above politics, above opinion. As head of state, the Queen has battled to stay out of politics, but at times needs to be at the forefront of Britain's national events and disasters. In 2017, the world woke up to one of the most shocking tragedies of recent times, the Grenfell Tower fire. 
where the fire was now spreading, people were reaching out from the front window, trying to grasp a bit of fresh air, trying to breathe. It looked like they were struggling. It was harrowing, torturing screams for help. It was honestly like a horror movie. When the fire got to its peak point, I could actually hear a man screaming, and then all of a sudden, the screaming just stopped. In the past, the Queen has been criticised for her slow response. In the 60s, she waited eight days before visiting the victims of the Aberfan disaster, an accident in a Welsh mining town which claimed the lives of 28 adults and 118 children. It was a sort of lesson as all. You have the need to show sympathy and to be there on the spot, which I think people craved from her. In her later reign, she's made sure that she makes a rapid response. Just 48 hours after the Grenfell Tower disaster, the Queen came to see the relief effort. One of the first charities to help at Grenfell was the British Red Cross. Mike Adamson is their chief executive. I think the visit of the Queen showed that the nation stood in solidarity with the community at Grenfell and that that community had not been forgotten and people wanted to express their empathy um, for the experience that they had had. And the Queen, I think, has a unique ability to do that because of the way in which she conducts herself with such dignity and a sort of quiet, caring approach. And she went immediately to greet people, um, to say hello and how are you? And this was a big event affecting a lot of people in our country. She showed her sympathy and empathy and tried to reach out and um, wanted to be there to help. It was very moving. It's actually bringing tears to my eyes. Um, to see her here, it shows that she is sincere and she truly cares. She looked at me directly in my eyes and I could see that she cared. Thank you for coming. The Queen's entire reign has presented her with many difficult moments. But the 2010s also held happier times for the 90-year-old monarch as a new generation of royals came to the forefront to support her. Eleven the Queen prepared to host one of the most iconic royal events of her reign. Her grandson and second in line to the throne, Prince William, married his university sweetheart, Catherine Middleton. It was a significant moment for the Queen's succession. The media are terribly excited about a wedding. The transparent happiness of the young couple just permeated right through the occasion. And that must have absolutely delighted the Queen. Marriage is vital to the royal family. It's about stability. It's the fact that you're going to continue down the generations. It's all about passing on the gene. Special relationship with all her grandchildren, particularly Prince William. It was the Queen herself who gave Prince William his constitutional history lessons. And when he becomes king, uh, it is in her constitutional style that he proposes to reign. I think the Queen and her grandchildren are all very close and she takes great interest in them. And they're getting to the age now when they want to help. But it always makes me cross that people concentrate so much on Prince William and forget the fact that he's not the heir to the throne the Prince of Wales is. Prince Charles's style is in stark contrast to his mother. While she tries to remain politically neutral, her son has always made his views very clear. Prince Charles consciously set out to take advantage of the relative constitutional freedom that a Prince of Wales has, as opposed to the monarch, to push the causes that he believes in. Therefore, he has felt it totally within his remit to write letters lobbying unashamedly prime ministers, ministers, members of the Church of England, bishops, to get his point of view across. He didn't write me that many letters, but when he did, they were perfectly sensible things. I mean, and he would be, they were much more in the sense of saying, look, I've been talking to people, for example, about countryside issues, or they might be about defence questions, and certainly around issues to do with climate change, the environment, and so on. He seems to have proclaimed that this is going to continue once he becomes king, and he believes he can rule in a different constitutional style from his mother. He will do very well. But, you know, I think that's all in the future. But I, I, I don't think one wants to be under any delusion of the fact that this will, this will be a great task. As the Queen continues into her 90s, Prince Charles has begun to take on more of his mother's responsibilities. 
on Remembrance Sunday 2017, he laid the wreath at the Cenotaph. As head of the armed forces, it's one of the Queen's most symbolic duties and points to a changing of the guard. One of the Queen's most important legacies will also be the Commonwealth. In an era that might otherwise have seen the disappearance of things monarchical, she brought it into the 21st century. You can't quantify it. She really has been part of the invisible glue holding it together. And the Commonwealth, in turn, has valued her energy, her commitment, her good humour and her enjoyment of it enormously. Thank you, Mr Prime Minister of Canada, for making me feel so old. <laughs> In 2018, there was confirmation that Prince Charles will succeed the Queen as head of the Commonwealth. It was the latest in a series of landmark events for the royal family in just a few years. In July 2013, Prince George was born to the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. For the first time since the reign of Queen Victoria, there was a monarch and three generations of direct successors to the throne, Prince Charles, Prince William and Prince George. Suddenly you have this wonderful four-tier royal family because there's the Queen and Prince Philip still very much out and about and, and operating. You have Prince Charles doing his own thing with Camilla and you have the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, what I, what I think of as a slightly more informal, um, younger, you know, the, the open shirt, if you like, uh, attitude to royalty. However, just a few years later, Prince Philip decided he could no longer be out and about and announced his retirement from public duty. In 2017, then 96 years old, he took the salute at Buckingham Palace as Captain General of the Royal Marines, his final solo public engagement after 65 years of service. Over the course of a life that has spanned more than nine decades, the Queen's history has been our history. She has been the only monarch that most of us have ever known. She has breathed new life into the monarchy. Can you imagine the Georges uh, deciding um, that they had to open up Buckingham Palace. Can you imagine Victoria doing walkabouts? Historians of the future will look periods in the history of the monarchy. She has been the very essence of what a constitutional monarch should be, a lesson, not just to Britain, but to the, the world as a whole. That here in the 21st century, a monarchy can work. We don't think of inherited privilege when we think of Elizabeth II. We think of a woman who's done her job bloody well. Britain's longest serving monarch has seen a time of unprecedented change. She's transformed from shy Lilibet to head of the nation and a world leader. She's also had a very interesting time. I mean, she's met over the years everybody uh, from Mandela to all the American presidents, you know. I think that she has enjoyed being queen. We've lived through the most extraordinary times of enormous change, but we've had this thread of total stability with the queen and Prince Philip. They're, they're you know, the rocks in a very stormy sea. Anybody who's had the privilege of meeting the queen will know that it's one of those life-defining moments. Um, she's absolutely lovely. There's a wonderful blue twinkle to her. She's got a very dry sense of humour. I can't think of anybody who I know who's met her and who has not been completely blown away by the experience. She is the, the sovereign and for, has been for a very long time. And to her, that's her life and her dedication. And she's never let us down and she's not going to. I met the Queen first when I was 12 years old. And I have never, ever come away from a meeting with her. The one doesn't feel that you are in the presence of someone truly exceptional. They will be very, very big shoes to fill. Very big shoes. Queen Elizabeth II has steered her family through times of incredible happiness and crippling grief and loss. Her monarchy has been through crises but she has managed to adapt and modernize. She's brought a special brand of magic to the House of Windsor. She's a woman driven by her duty to serve the British and Commonwealth peoples. Hers has been a remarkable reign, and she will always be our queen. Good night.
and good luck to you all. Good luck to you all. Good luck to you all. The idea was that the Queen and the nation would be entertained by breathtaking acts from all over Britain. There's this wonderful performance that was going on 60 feet above our heads. I had this terrible vision of these people somehow falling from the, the top of the dome and crushing the royal family and thinking that this would not be, this is not a great headline for the world. The Millennium celebrations included a spectacular fireworks display. But inside the dome, Blair's plan was turning into a night the Queen would rather forget. News editor Stuart Purvis was a guest at the dome. You have to remember that the Millennium Night celebration at uh, Greenwich was not a royal production. It was almost a political production, really. Uh, and it showed. Uh, it was really, really a bad event. I suspect the Queen thought, this isn't one of my shows, if you like. And she was really not comfortable with the 